Hello, everybody. Welcome to my presentation about computational modeling of neural development from basic principles to realistic neural systems. I would like to start by highlighting the fact that the brain is extremely complex. Here you see a visualization obtained from diffusion tensor imaging where one can see fiber tracts in the human brain. Different colors indicate different orientations of those fiber tracts. If one looks at this quantitatively, then there are approximately 100 billion neurons in an average human brain and about 10 to the 15 synapses, which are the connections between neurons. Now, instead of modeling the final result of the development of the brain, one can also look into ways to model how this extremely complex develops from genetic rules, because at the end of the day, the brain develops from a single precursor cell, the zygote. And so the question becomes, can we somehow model how genetic rules lead to the final resulting brain structure? And in order to capture this developmental process, one needs to model the development of uh, or the interactions between genetic rules and the external environment where there are physical interactions or diffusible substances and or electrical activity. For those who may not know very well the neural structure, um, so neurons are composed of a cell body or soma and, and then there are axons and dendrites which allow neurons to communicate with one another. And these neurons form very complex biological neural networks. So one example that we looked at in the past was on the so-called cortical layer architecture. So the cortex is the part of the brain that deals with higher cognitive functions such as planning and, 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 and uh, cognition. And we can there differentiate structurally different layers in the cortex. And interestingly, we see this in all mammalian um, cortices, we see this layered structure. However, this layered structure has different dimensions in different species. And so um, if you look, for example, at the human temporal cortex, then we have actually uh, quite a, a small number of neurons as compared, for example, to the macaque visual cortex. And, and also the proportions of different neurons in different layers is different. And so one question that arises is, can, one, can, can we somehow explain these different proportions and cell numbers across different species? So what we did in, 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 in our work was we created a gene regulatory network. So we created a computational model of how gene um, genes interact with one another during neural development. And we did this in an, in an abstract way. So we, stay, we, we started with a, a simple genetic state that then can differentiate into different types of, of cells and, and neurons. And so in this case, we would actually differentiate into layer one cells. Um, so early on, they are called marginal zone cells. And then later on, we get layer six cells, layer five cells, layer four cells, and so on. And also we have apoptosis. And we demonstrated using uh, agent-based computational modeling that we can indeed generate um, layered structures of cortex uh, similar to the observations. And here you see also that this is done with the right sequence. So here we have uh, at the very beginning, we have a, a, a small pool of uh, pre precursor cells. And these cells then differentiate into the different uh, layers. And you can see that there is this characteristic inside out development of the layers. So actually it's, it's layer one that first develops and layer six and then layer five goes through layer six and four and three and two and so on. And, and uh, this is uh, essentially the, the, the correct uh, sequence of layered development. And we published this work um, um, uh, recently. 
uh, in, in, in cerebral cortex. Now, of course, one important challenge here is also the computational demand in terms of in terms of resources that are needed. And, and uh, in order to tackle this challenge, what we did is we, we actually collaborated with uh, Intel and, and, and our collaborators from CERN and others. And we showed that actually by, by creating highly optimized code, one can actually increase the efficiency and the performance of the computational modeling and simulation very much. And so here you see um, different um, stages of a developmental model um, where we essentially modeled a very, very um, 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 kind of a, a toy model that serves as a as a use case to see if our if our software and code is efficient. And um, what here ha what happens here is that we simulated uh, about thirty two million cells, and these cells interact with one with one another, and and also. Uh, they secrete substances, actually two different kinds of substances, and um, the 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 blue cells they they like the substance that they secrete, uh, which we can call blue substance, and the red cells like their uh, specific substance. And you can see that after some time, uh, clusters emerge. And what we could show is actually that by using the smart ways of of uh, rendering the code more efficient, we could we could uh, improve or scale up the 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 efficiency by uh, several hundreds of times. And uh, this was published, uh, as I showed before, um, in um, in advances in engineering software. So we then uh, also went one step further, and we we looked into creating a general purpose simulator, a so-called agent-based modeling software. And um, uh, by using uh, these tricks that or, or these kind of um, results that we have uh, employed before uh, in order to improve the code. And um, we have also, of course, then uh, to, uh, used insights from previous projects uh, before that. and. We came together as a collaboration. So here you see our collaboration members of the Biodynamo collaboration. And we managed to, to create and implement such a highly performing agent-based simulator. And arguably, this is one of the most performing currently in, in, in the world. So we can actually also model neural tissues. And uh, this, uh, this uh, software has been published as open source, so everyone can download it. I would definitely recommend you if you're interested to have a look. Uh, we have a, a website where we have a lot of materials to help uh, new users um, learning learning to use Biodynamo and, and understanding the structure of Biodynamo. And uh, so we would very much welcome anyone who, who is interested in in, in, in learning and, and, and applying and potentially even extending uh, or contributing to Biodynamo because we are an open source software collaboration. So we are very much um, uh, in, 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 um, in, in uh, we, we need collaboration with, with uh, the community essentially. And uh, also uh, we are not only a, a research uh, collaboration, but we also, are engaged in didactic uh, endeavors. So, for instance, we we have uh, in, in a few years ago we have partnered with Intel and uh, and CERN Open Lab and Newcastle University at that time, and then we have uh, created a competition that um, that attracted uh, more than seventeen thousand students all over the world, and we then uh, also uh, showed that indeed this kind of competitive uh, framework uh, has 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 very uh, very good benefits because we essentially managed to to create highly optimized code and then we, um, and and then we also invited the winners to uh, to CERN to uh, for for a secondment so uh, here you see an example uh, simulation that was done with biodynamo uh, you can see th there are different two different types of neurons uh, for di with different colors, and essentially they grow out their axons and dendrites, and so we can generate highly realistic neuronal morphologies by using 
by Dynamo and by using this agent-based modeling approach. And what is also very important here is we can also take into account physical processes. So we can really model mechanical interactions, diffusion of substances, decay of substances, and so on. And so here, just as an example, uh, we have two neurons. Um, one of them is is simulated, and one of them is is uh, real. And uh, I leave it to you to to guess which one is the real one. Uh, feel free to to get in touch with me uh, if you would like to discuss this line of research in more detail. And by the way, these are uh, so-called retinal ganglion cells, which are uh, at the rear of the eye in the in the neural tissue of the retina. We can then also look at various features of those neurons. So for instance, we can look at the branching distance from the soma, so the branching distance from the cell body of, of those uh, dendrites or, or axons. Uh, in this case, it would be dendrites. And then we can compare with experimental observations and, and see if our models are in line with, with those. And this, of course, gives, gives us clues whether our models are, are realistic uh, but they are plausible and ultimately by having this iterative interaction with experimentalists we can then create more and more realistic computational models that then help us better understand why do neurons look as they look and um, potentially also better understand how we could uh, uh, use these insights for example for medical applications ultimately. So here you see a, a larger system where we have, uh, again, uh, neurons of different types and, and, and these, um, these neurons uh, grow out. Again, they're dendrites and, and axons and create quite complex structures. And we need computational modeling in order to better understand those systems. How do these systems arise? But we can also use Bidynamo for other biological systems, uh, for, such as, for instance, cancer. So in this case, we have used Biodynamo together with another software. So it was a hybrid model where we modeled um, how a cancer grows. Uh, it, in this case, a glioblastoma, so a brain cancer, how it glows, grows, and then how different types of cells um, uh, change over time. So um, we can really model how in the center of the tumor where there's not a lot of oxygen, how then you get necrotic cells, for instance. And we can also measure the uh, distribution and, and simulate the distribution of oxygen in three dimensions. And ultimately, we could also look into interactions between cancer cells and healthy cells. So this is these are there are a lot of advantages of using computational methods because they allow to model systems um, and then make certain predictions. And it is often very difficult to experimentally measure all of those information, right? It is uh, It can be extremely complex to, to get such information and computation models can help get insights about such, such parts of systems which are often difficult to measure. Now, what I showed you before was on the level of, of single cells and, and interactions between single cells. But we can also create computational models of more large-scale neural systems, such example, such for example, networks of the brain with hubs. So hubs are networks, uh, hubs are nodes in networks that have a lot of connections, more connections than one would uh, think based on a random, regular network. So that, that's why these are called so-called complex networks. And, and in this case, for example, a hub could be this node here because it has a lot of connections. Some of those connections go, go from this node to another node. Some of those connections go from other nodes to this node and so on. So why is this interesting or relevant for, for, for neuroscience or computational neuroscience? The reason is that also in the human brain, and in, 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 in most uh, neural systems, not all, but uh, most of, of uh, especially the higher, um, in, um, higher cognitive uh, systems, we have hubs. So we have certain areas 
of the brain that are many that have many more connections than one would think uh, a, r a random regular network would have and this is the case also in the human brain and and also interestingly this is this is actually relevant from a clinical perspective because often these hubs are involved in certain diseases such as for example in alzheimer's disease and and one can also look at this mathematically so in a random regular network we have if we look at the distribution of connections so the so-called degree distribution uh, so the degree of a node is, is the number of connections that it participates in if we look here at the red distribution this would be the distribution that we would expect from a from a random regular type of network so not a complex network however if you look at the more realistic biologically realistic neural network uh, such as the connections between brain regions in in a human brain then we get something uh, very different because there we have actually a disproportionate amount of nodes that are very highly connected so this so this is the fat tile here so these are nodes that that can be considered as hubs and and so the question is how do these hubs arise how can we somehow create a computation model that is biologically realistic and that can explain the the origin of of hubs and there are different types of models around but often they are uh, not uh, not very realistic and so what we did is we created a very basic model uh, which we called the nonlinear growth model and in this model the uh, the hubs develop because the network grows exponentially so it grows um, it starts slowly and then grows faster and faster because this is what one sees in many biological systems is that one has a certain phase often during development where the system grows exponentially fast very fast and the other um, feature of this model is that we assume that new new coming nodes they connect to the older nodes the pre-existing nodes and if one simulates this process or this this uh, rather basic growth model one can show that actually there are uh, after some times uh, some time hubs develop so one gets nodes that ha have very many connections and this is uh, in this case this would be for example the blue nodes here these are the nodes which which develop quite early and therefore the new nodes that come later on they project to the early ones and so the early on ones we get a lot of connections so what we did is we we tested this this model on a re real world network such as for instance uh, physical interactions between proteins uh, then we looked at connections of the brain of the macaque monkey we also looked at the c elegance neural network where we have uh, the wiring diagram between individual neurons and we looked at the also at an art artificial network so a network that is not biologically grown uh, which would be the network of international airline connections so connections between airports um, uh, where different airlines serve those connections and we create we, we looked also at two other models the so-called preferential attachment model which is not biologically uh, plausible because it it has certain assumptions in it that uh, render it difficult or uh, not not really realistic and and then we looked at the duplication divergence model which is um, which has been formulated for 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 uh, genetic um, uh, evolutionary dynamics but not for neural uh, growth or or, or uh, so it's so it's difficult to justify this in a neural context while our model uh, is 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 directly applicable to a neural network and what we then this did is we looked at certain features i will not go into much detail of what what these features exactly mean but we essentially we we looked at how well uh, can we explain those measured features from those real network 
um, from these complex real networks how, and how well do these different models compare with one another and what we could show is actually that our uh, nonlinear growth model and we had two different uh, versions of this nonlinear growth model and um, uh, we, we could actually demonstrate that in in, in most cases the nonlinear growth model very well captured those those measured features and and so we uh, we think that this model could serve as a benchmark model for comparison with other models in the future and in and the nice thing is it is entirely realistic so we can also use this to really model in the future um, detailed neural network development and self-organization and and also what is uh, interesting is that uh, it can be uh, also used to better understand certain uh, features that one observes in in certain neurodevelopmental disorders so one thing that people have uh, seen is that uh, that in in the brains of preterm subjects uh, preterm born subjects so subjects that were born earlier than than normal then that the, their, their brains are slightly different. And um, what is different in these brains, uh, which would uh, be shown here in blue, so the blue line here, you, you will see that this line, the red, li the red line, which is uh, control subjects, so these are not preterm born subjects, uh, is lower than the blue, the blue line. And, this, uh, and what this means is that in this case, what we plotted is the rich club connectivity, the rich club organization. And preterm born subjects have a, tend to have a higher, um, a higher rich club connectivity than the, the uh, control subjects. And we could actually explain with our realistic computation model uh, why this may be. We, we get the same result. We also get a higher rich club connectivity for preterm born subjects as compared to control subjects so so the, this model could potentially also explain what is what is why do we see these differences and uh, we published this this work um, in, in 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 the journal of royal society open science so to conclude uh, we i've shown uh, in the first part computer modeling and simulations of cortical self-organization with this, this layered structure. And then and, and also um, I've shown uh, or presented the Bidynamo uh, software or introduced the software, which allows to scale up to larger systems, neurodevelopmental models. And then in the second part, I've shown a computation model for large scale inter real brain network self-organization so how do certain features of of brain networks develop including hubs and then also the relevance of this for neurodevelopmental disorders and so uh, there are a lot of potential applic uh, applications of this kind of approach in the future because now we are at a stage where we can really scale up and render uh, more detailed simulations uh, and create more detailed simulations uh, of course, we need experimental data for this to inform this, but um, this would be the overall future approach. And so, in the in the future, I, I would like to highlight that this kind of models allow for mechanistic modeling of neural uh, development, and we have published uh, several papers in the past on this topic. Uh, here are some examples. We can also use agent-based modeling as a stepping stone towards functional circuits of so circuits that do something useful computationally uh, and this has also been published uh, by us in the past and then uh, we can scale this up and and what scaling up allows us is that we can create biomedically relevant simulations so, so here are a few examples of such bio uh, biomedical biomedically relevant uh, papers and finally, this could then also be used to better diagnose when something goes wrong, for example, during development or later on during the generation. And we have also here published several papers. And so I would like to conclude by, by thanking you for your attention and, and all my collaborators. I cannot list all of them and my lab 
I'm very grateful to have great colleagues and uh, it's a pleasure to be working with them. And of course, I want to thank the funders of this uh, research. Um, I'm very grateful for that. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to, to uh, email me uh, at r.power at surrey.ac.uk. Uh, and feel free to follow me on Twitter. And uh, thanks again for your attention.